Doing surveys, talking to people. Oh my God, I have to talk to people. <laughs> I hate that. Sometimes I talk to people and they look away and I can't get them to leave. <laughs> then I start crying. Okay, this chapter, this is chapter nine. I know I'm not caught up yet. This is the 10th week and I'm only on chapter nine. But chapter nine has to do with alternatives to traditional prosecution. Um, normally, uh, potentially, you can go to trial. As we learned last time, 90 to 95 percent of all cases never go to trial. They are plea bargain. Uh, so somebody pleads guilty. And this is one of the reasons why prosecuting attorneys have such a good record. Because uh, normally the individual that uh, they have arrested, if the evidence is good, if the evidence is, is uh, solid, uh, then they won't go to trial at all. The guy will just plead guilty and they will reduce the charges uh, and uh, he will go on probation or, or whatever. The, do the, the judge, of course, has to decide what the, uh, what, what's going to have to happen to this individual. Uh, alternative dispute resolution. Uh, most cases are resolved through negotiation or by alternative dispute resolution. They're not, uh, they don't go to trial. Uh, the judge is still involved. He's the one that makes the decisions, uh, but at the same time, uh, they don't have to uh, spend the money on trials. Money is very important in the United States. We're Americans. Americans are, money is really important. So we've got this, uh, this guy that was murdered by the Saudi government. Remember that guy, Khashoggi? Khashoggi? He was a, um, he was a, uh, a newspaper man, for, and he worked for the Washington Post. And he went into the, uh, the um, uh, embassy, in, uh, the Saudi embassy in, in Ankara, which is the capital of, of Turkey, and uh, he never came out. And now we found out that uh, they not only killed him, but they chopped him up. I know, how much fun is that? They did an autopsy on him. They had a guy there that, that can do an autopsy in seven minutes. I used to do autopsies. It took hours to do an autopsy. You have to cut everything out, and you have to measure it and weigh it, find out if it's what's going on. You have to take out the intestines and slice them and look at them to find out if they had polyps or cancer. Or It's fun. You have a good time. It stinks. Oh my God, does it ever smell that? I know. In the old days, we never wore masks. We didn't wear masks. We didn't even wear gloves. We just did the autopsy. I know. Of course, you'd have to take a shower afterwards. Hopefully, they'd let you take a shower. Anyway, why am I talking about this? Oh, Khashoggi. Khashoggi, okay. Uh, so, so Khashoggi died, uh, obviously. And, and they have admitted that, that uh, he was uh, killed. Why am I talking about this? What was my point? What's Khashoggi got to do with anything? Oh, money. I was talking about money. Why, why money is so important. That's right. Okay, so, uh, uh, so Khashoggi gets killed by the Saudis. And um, uh, so the, the administration has to talk about this because this is, he's an important reporter for the Washington Post. And he's a, he's a reporter. Uh, so the, uh, the government has to talk about it. So we're afraid to uh, attack these, the Saudis. And the reason is because we have a $110 billion contract for um, uh, arms, uh, arms, an arms shipment that we're sending to the Saudis. So we're afraid to say anything negative about the Saudis because of this deal we have with them that has to do with $110 billion. How important is $110 billion? Is it important? Is money important? Is money more important than people? Than the life of, of this guy wasn't even American. He was a Saudi. He wasn't even American. So is he worth $110 billion? <clears throat> Well, first of all, we're talking talking apples and oranges. We should we should never talk money and people's lives, right? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. How, how much is somebody worth? That doesn't even make sense. We can't even make that argument. 
but the administration did, unfortunately. And now it looks like the money is more important than the person is. Of course, he wasn't even an American citizen. I know. But he had a girlfriend. I don't know if that's a fault. <laughs> so how important is money is the question. And the answer is, well, it's pretty important if you don't have it. Uh, so it's a lot more important if you don't have it. So for that reason, a lot of times, uh, these cases don't, uh, don't go to trial. And if, if they don't go to trial, it doesn't cost nearly as much money. And this is one of the reasons why uh, right now you're, you're uh, watching all the political ads and they're talking about uh, electing a, a prosecuting attorney or an attorney general uh, from New Mexico and from Arizona. And the reason that they're talking about that is because the better the prosecuting attorney, the less money that they spend, the less money that the government has to spend. If, he's, if he is able to go into a, uh, a court of law and negotiate a deal without it going to trial, it's going to be a lot less, it's going to cost a lot less money. So this is one of the reasons why we're talking about uh, 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 attorney generals and prosecuting attorneys is because they actually save money for the administration, the better they are at negotiating. Okay, so negotiation is extremely important. Remember, 90 to 95 percent of all cases, this is civil and criminal cases, never go to court. And if they don't go to court, it doesn't cost that much money. So judges spend most of their time not trying cases. Most judges uh, spend most of their time negotiating uh, try, um, uh, convictions and whatnot. In 2009, only 1.2 percent of, of federal civil cases were decided in a trial. That means that 98.8 percent of all of all case civil cases uh, uh, were uh, plea bargained. They were negotiated, and this is one of the reasons why, if you're somebody like Donald Trump, who get who used to get sued all the time, uh, he can claim that he never lost a case. And the reason he never lost a case is because that was part of the negotiation that he would say that he didn't lose the case. So he's never lost a case. But, of course, sometimes he had to pay. Is that a loss? Well, it is a loss as far as he would. He lost money. He lost money, but he didn't lose the case. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't charged with any criminal intent, even though... Or his ego. I don't know. Yeah, ego is very important. <laughs> In two, 2002, only 4.7% of the criminal cases involved uh, a trial. So in most cases, uh, these, uh, the individual is able to negotiate. So we're going to talk about alternative dispute resolution. Many cases are settled by negotiation without many cases. Almost all the cases are settled by negotiation without the assistance of a third party. So the two just get together and they decide, well, you know, yeah, you did this wrong, and yeah, okay, uh, well, if you pay me this amount of money, then, then I, won't, uh, I won't take you to court. That's usually the way things work out. Negotiation might be formal, as happens when management and union representatives negotiate a labor contract, or they may be informal, uh, such as a, a divorce. Uh, I've been divorced twice. Uh, both times were non-contested divorces. Uh, but I almost lost one case, as strange as that may seem, even though she wasn't contested. She was gone. She was had left the state. So she, but the state uh, tried to take my kids away from me because they didn't believe a man could raise children. Only women can raise children. Everybody knows that in Texas. <laughs> as it turns out, I wasn't a citizen of Texas and neither were my children. We were citizens of the state of Indiana, and Indiana has different ideas than Texans do. So they would, they would have had to have uh, uh, come in and, and seized my children. The state of Texas would have had to have done that. But they didn't, of course, because they were citizens of another state. They could have been sued by the state of Indiana. Arbitration is one form of alternative dispute resolution. Uh, when the parties agree to binding ar arbitration, they agree to accept the decision of the arbiter. This, if you ever, if you watch any sports, football or basketball or baseball, a lot of times uh, a, uh, uh, a player will, uh, will uh, try to get more money from, his, from whatever team he's playing for, and it'll go to arbitration. And it's usually binding arbitration. 
So one, the guy will say, well, I'm this important and I'm worth this much money to the team. And then the owner will say, I can't pay that much money. Uh, so he's going to have to take a, a, a lower wage. And then there's an arbiter that decides whether, uh, how much money the guy's going to get uh, in arbitration. And it's usually binding arbitration. So the arbiter gets to decide uh, one way or the other. And, and neither, and both of them agree that whatever the arbiter says, that's how much money the guy will get. In non-binding arbitration, if one of the parties is dissatisfied with the arbiter's decision, that person may ask that the, the case be tried before a judge or a jury, and then of course it goes to a judge or a jury. <clears throat> arbitration, uh, whether binding or non-binding, uses trial-like procedures. The parties present the evidence and they argue the case, and the arbiter uh, makes a decision. And this is one of the reasons why uh, most uh, uh, athletes will have a, uh, they will, <laughs> they will, have, they will uh, be part of a, uh, what, what am I trying to think of? What's this guy, what do they call these guys? They have an agent, I'm sorry, that's what I was trying to think of. They have an agent, and the agent, of course, will negotiate for them. They will be uh, part of the arbitration. So the player doesn't actually have to go to court. It's usually the agent that goes to court. And it's the agent that decides uh, the limits as far as wages are concerned. And then, of course, we have an arbiter. In recent years, arbitration has been criticized for being overly formal and time-consuming. And, of course, uh, the arbitration for, uh, for baseball hasn't really started yet because the, the World Series just started yesterday. And I think, I think Boston won the first game, didn't they? Didn't Boston win the first game? Nobody cares about baseball. I am so shocked. <laughs> I'm not watching the ball games either. I hate both Boston. We're all worried about your assignments. That's why. Oh, is that right? Yeah. That's why you're not watching. Okay. We're doing our research paper. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get all my research papers on the first of November. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not holding my breath either. Just in case I don't have to or something. Whoops. <clears throat> A summary jury is that right? Yeah. A summary jury is like a conventional uh, jury trial, uh, though it's shorter. Lawyers tell jurors about the witnesses, uh, what the witnesses would have said if they were present. Uh, the lawyers argue the case and try to answer jurors' questions about the facts. The judges tell uh, the jury about the uh, law, what the law is, and tries to answer jurors' questions about the law. The jurors then deliberate. That wasn't me, was it? Is that somebody else's phone? Anyway. My son tried to call me last night. My phone's almost gone. Oh. Uh, summary, so summary court martials. This is what happens in a summary uh, court martial. Uh, usually, there, there's only the uh, individual that is being court martialed. Uh, and uh, they may have an attorney, they may not have an attorney, uh, but all of the individuals that are the witnesses, they don't, they don't even show up. They're not even there. It's the attorneys that talk about these things. And then there is a, uh, it's usually the commander uh, is, uh, acts as the judge, and then he decides what's going to happen. At the end of the day. And that's a summary court martial. Uh, it's usually, sometimes it's only between three people. It's the, uh, it's the guy that has brought the charges against the individual. This is the individual that's under, that's being court-martialed here. And you can tell the, that she is the uh, one being court-martialed because she's not wearing a hat. She's under arrest, and, and when you're under arrest in the military, they take, you, they take your hat, and they don't let you have a hat until, until they decide that you're, you, you know. Then they give you your hat back afterwards. Anyway, she's the one that... Uh, She's the one being court martial. <coughs> as interesting as that is. Okay. Anyway, that's a summary uh, jury trial. In recent years, verdicts from a summary jury trial have become binding and enforceable. Uh, this process educates the lawyers and clients on how a conventional jury might view the facts of the law. So a lot, sometimes what will happen is before they go to trial, they'll have a summary trial. They'll have a summary jury trial. 
and that uh, will give them information as to uh, what might potentially happen if they actually do go to court, if they do go to a trial. Uh, once educated, the lawyers and their clients are more amenable to settling the case, of course. If they see that they can't win the case or they normally would have lost the case because of the summary trial, a lot of times they'll settle. And that's the way it works. Mediation uses a neutral person. Uh, this is the way you do it here on the reservation. You have mediation. Uh, mediation uses a neutral person, the mediator, to uh, work with litigant, litigants and their lawyers to, to achieve a settlement. The mediator does not have authority to decide the controversy, but rather they act as a facilitator, meeting with each party in an effort to broker an agreement. And that's the way it's done here on the reservation. Are you talking about peacemaking? Yes, peacemaking, exactly. Peacemaking is you're using a mediator. And theoretically, has nothing to do with either side. Hopefully, has nothing to do with either side. Sometimes, one side's a relative or something, yeah, or a clan, yeah. And that's not fair. Or potentially, it's not fair. Uh, people often prefer mediation because they are, are risk averse. Uh, they prefer contra uh, controversies to be settled by them rather than uh, decided for them. Uh, of course, if they go to trial, then the, uh, the, the case will be decided for them. Compared to litigated divorces, uh, research suggests that mediation uh, encourages parents to comply with divorce agreements, uh, to remain involved in their children's lives, and renegotiate relationships in a more adaptive way. And of course, that is a case of, an, of a divorce. Uh, that's what happened with my daughter. My daughter was... Uh, <laughs> My daughter decided to have a baby, so she and this guy decided to have a baby. Well, they never lived together. Well, actually, they lived together before she had the baby. But after she had the baby, he left. He just left. Uh, so they kind of interacted a little bit, not a whole lot, uh, while the kid was growing up. This is in Florida. So my daughter decided to move. And when she decided to move, he decided that he wanted to be... He wanted to be the father. <laughs> so she, he took her to court uh, to try to get her to stay in Florida. Does that make sense? Sure it does. <clears throat> so he took her to court. Uh, and in Florida, the father has the same rights as, as the mother, despite the fact that the father had never lived with the mother or the child. Uh, he was still taking care of the child from time to time. He's, he was babysitting the child. He got him on select weekends. He got him for holidays, that kind of thing. He was a holiday dad. Uh, so he was able to actually take my daughter to court. <clears throat> but he wasn't paying child support. <laughs> okay. But he still had his rights. So they went to court and they used the mediator. And the mediator, of course, heard both sides. Both of them hired lawyers. Uh, the baby daddy hired a very expensive, the most expensive and the best lawyer in town. And my daughter picked a lawyer that was cheaper and a lawyer that was a female. So he had a male, male lawyer and my daughter had a female lawyer. And uh, the female lawyer said, you have a really strong case. He's never really shown any interest in raising this child. So the probability of them forcing you to stay in Florida is not very high. She had a new job in, in Iowa, and the job in Iowa paid $60,000 a year, and she was getting $45,000 a year down in Florida. And cost of living is much higher in Florida than it is in, in, in Iowa. So all of this made a lot of sense to me. Economically, it certainly made a lot of sense. And the fact that my daughter was really taking care of this kid almost all by herself, that made sense to me. So I couldn't see any reason why this guy had a case whatsoever. But he had the best lawyer in town, and they went to see a mediator. The mediator, of course, um, made the decision that Roxy could leave, that Roxy could move to, uh, to Iowa, but she would have to ship the kid down to Florida from time to time so that the dad could see the kid. I know, didn't make any sense to me either. Uh, so now we're spending thousands of dollars. <laughs> He's not mad enough to come up. 
He did come up last weekend, as a matter of fact. He's not mad enough. It's two days away. It's, it's two days away. So, so, he, so yeah, he, he comes up from time to time. Why is he not paying for the travel expenses? That wasn't part of the deal. Uh, each side has to pay their own travel expenses. But he's kind of a cheap, can I say bastard? Can I use that word? Yeah. <laughs> he's kind of cheap. So uh, he wants us to pay, uh, he wants us to always pay for the, the child. He wants us to always buy the, the plane oh, ticket for the kid. He can, he can see this if he wants. I think he's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> I second that. Anyway, uh, uh, and he doesn't know that I'm down here. He thinks I'm up in Iowa. It's probably the gunshot thing. Yeah, he's probably the guy with the gun. <laughs> with the gun. No, it's Sharon. I know it's Sharon. <laughs> Sharon and her 11, her Glock 11. <laughs> uh, anyway, he, so he thinks I'm down there. I, he thinks I'm up in Iowa instead of here because uh, there's no other male influence in the area. My, my wife is there, my daughter is there, and uh, he thinks that I'm there. I'm teaching you how to be a, a male, a man. I'm, but I'm here <laughs> making enough money so that we can ship him down there every once in a while. <laughs> anyway, so that's one of the reasons I'm still working is because I need to make enough money to ship the kid down to Florida from time to time. Yeah, it does, because you really like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not it at all. That's why the baby daddy. <laughs> the baby daddy. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> no, I like you guys. You're all right. I'm glad I'm here. I mean, I could be anywhere, couldn't I? I could be in a worse, much worse place. Florida. You can be in Florida. Florida, exactly. <laughs> Having fist fights with this guy. Um, he was kind of abusive when he was living with my daughter. And he hit, he hit my daughter a couple of times. And, uh, of course, my daughter's only 4'11". This guy's 6'4", weighs like 250, 275. And my daughter, if she weighs 100 pounds, that's a lot. She's, she's a little overweight. So she's only 4'11". And here this 6'4". 250 pound man mountain is punching my daughter in the face. You know, he's got his fist is bigger than my daughter's head. That's how I mean it. It just didn't make any sense. So my son's down in Florida right now, and we're afraid to let the two of them see each other because we're afraid my son will just deck him. Do it. Do it. He would. Field trip. Oh, he Florida. hates spousal abuse. He he he's pissed. And he says, if they hit, if they hit you once, they'll hit you twice. That's true. That's true. what my son says. <clears throat> so he, he's, uh, we're trying to keep it, keep the two of them apart. Uh, should courts force litigants to try um, uh, alternative dispute resolution before settling a, uh, before setting a case for trial? Attorneys like the process, believing that it is fair and saves clients time and money. Uh, so arbitration, of course, always works. Uh, it always does save money. However, mandatory <coughs> ADR uh, can lead to an unintended effect. Some lawyers file meritless claims knowing that their claims will have settlement value in mediation. And of course, we have seen this uh, with, uh, with uh, people suing uh, Donald Trump. Uh, one of the individuals that seems to, to keep getting cases against Donald Trump is a guy by the name of Michael Avenatti. And he keeps suing uh, Trump. Uh, he was the uh, lawyer in the case of uh, Stormy Daniels. Uh, he also had a client uh, that uh, claimed that uh, Kavanaugh had molested her. So he had one of the Kavanaugh clients. And he also had Stormy Daniels as a client, as interesting as that is. Were these uh, false claims? Well, the Stormy Daniels case has been thrown out of court. Stormy Daniels' case was a really weird, weird case. Uh, Stormy Daniels and Donald Trump allegedly had an affair. <clears throat> After the affair was over with, he paid her $120,000, and she had to sign an agreement that she wouldn't disclose any of this information. 
But when Donald Trump signed the, uh, the contract, he signed it as somebody else. He didn't sign it as Donald Trump. He signed it as his alter ego, Michael Brady or something else, you know, weird. So she claimed that uh, she wasn't bound by that contract. And so she came out and she wrote a book about, about Donald Trump, about her affair with Donald Trump. And you can read it if you want. I, it's kind of pornographic. I don't know. If, she's a porn star, so it, it is kind of pornographic. There are no pictures, uh, but you can read the book if you like. Uh, anyway, anyway, so this is, uh, uh, of course, Donald Trump's lawyers claim that it was a meritless case, that she it should never have been brought uh, to, to uh, it, it should never have been seen by a judge. And now it's been thrown out of court. So we'll see what happens with poor Michael Avenatti. He doesn't seem to be winning very many cases here lately. But for a while, he was on television like every night. He was on, uh, he was on uh, Colbert. Uh, he was on uh, Jimmy Fallon. You know, he was on all of these uh, different shows. He was on Fox News. He was on CNN. He was on MSNBC. So we saw it. We were seeing Don, uh, uh, Michael Avenatti every night. And of course, now his case has been thrown out of court. So we'll see what happens next. I keep saying that. We will see what happens. Problem solving courts uh, were developed uh, to re rehabilitate and monitor individuals in the community rather than incarcerate. Uh, of course, uh, these uh, cases usually have to do with uh, uh, criminal law rather than civil law. So we have these, uh, these problem solving courts. They don't have anything to do with the, uh, the actual court, but they are binding. <clears throat> the three major justifications have been offered for the development and expansion of such community alternatives. One is that it's more humanitarian. It's cruel and unusual. Punishment may not be inflicted, of course, by these courts. Uh, throwing somebody in jail is cruel and can be seen as cruel and unusual in and, and, and select cases. Uh, the cost is much less, it's much less expensive to monitor and treat an offender in the community than it is to incarcerate them. How much does it cost to incarcerate somebody? It costs thousands of dollars a day, depending on what type of a jail they go to. If they go to a federal judge, a federal uh, uh, facility, it can be as much as $50,000 a day if they are in uh, isolation, if they have to isolate the, uh, uh, the individual. Uh, correctional uh, facilities house inmates who, as a group, have wide-ranging rehabilitation needs, so the specialty courts can deal with a specific type of problem, like drug abuse or, uh, or, or other uh, select problems, or homelessness. Is, is, is it against the law to be homeless? Do you have to have some place to live? Why do they pick these guys up so much? What do they call it? when they pick these guys up, somebody that's homeless. They call it vagrancy. What does vagrancy mean? Vagrancy means homeless, exactly. Wait a minute. <laughs> so what if you lose your job and now you can't pay for your rent, you can't pay your rent, and all of a sudden you don't have a place to live? Do you go to jail? Sometimes, if they catch you, yeah, you can, be, you can be taken to jail. So what if you've got kids? What happens to your kids? They get put in the foster care system. And all of a sudden, you're in jail, and your kids are in, well, everybody's in jail. They're in foster care, and you're in jail, and all you did was lose your job. <clears throat> or you're living in your car. If you get caught living in your car, they can charge you with vagrancy, depending on, on the, the uh, type of area that you're living in. You can be thrown in jail for not having a place to live. Wow. Really? That's the way it works. Ah, so what are we going to do with these people? I mean, otherwise we incarcerate them. If you incarcerate them, you just put them in the, the uh, general population, in a jail. Does that make sense? Well, doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. So what are we going to do with them? They've broken the law by not having a job and not having a place to live. What's going to happen next? Well, that's the, uh, that's the whole purpose of the special reports. <clears throat> when populations are more homogenous, 
as in a mental health or drug treatment setting, and security concerns are fewer than specialized and intensive treatment is more feasible. Uh, so individuals that are suffering from a mental illness, it doesn't make any sense to throw them in a, uh, to incarcerate them. If, somebody's in a, if somebody is, uh, uh, has a drug problem, it doesn't make any sense to throw them in jail and make them go cold turkey. And does that make any sense? So it makes a lot more sense to send them to treatment. So they're around other people that have the same problem. The sequential inter intercept model uh, identifies five stages of criminal justice process at which standard steps could be interrupted and a community treatment alternatives can be substituted. So what we want to do is we want to keep these people out of jail because it's so expensive to incarcerate them. And we also need them to not have the problem that they had before. So we need to treat them. If they have a drug problem, we need to treat them for their drug problem. If they have a mental illness, we need to treat them for their mental illness. So as we are dealing with this individual, or if somebody is homeless, we of course need to find them a job. So as we are arresting these individuals at any juncture during these five times, we can intercept them and not send them to jail. We can intercept them and send them into treatment or we can send them to a mental hospital, or we can send them to uh, a homeless court. Intercept one is law enforcement and emergency services. When individuals with behavioral mental health uh, disorders encounters any first responder, it can result in arrest, criminal charges, conviction, and incarceration. And of course, we, I guess we haven't talked about this. Uh, there was a, 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 does anybody get New Mexico news besides me? I try not to watch it, but sometimes I can't help myself. Okay, they arrested a guy, yeah, they get arrested a guy last night who had a mental illness, uh, but instead of, instead of sending him to jail, um, and, and of course he was uh, belligerent, and uh, he was attacking the police officer. Uh, so they could have charged him with a lot of stuff and thrown him in jail for an extended length of time because he wouldn't, he was attacking the police officer. Okay. Uh, but instead of doing that, they sent him to a homeless or to a, a mental health court, and uh, they sent him home uh, with his medications. Normally, when people have a problem like this, it's because they've gone off their medication, and a lot of times they go off their medication because they don't have enough money to pay for medication. So now somebody is paying for his medication. Probably the city of Albuquerque is paying for his medication. And the individual is at home taking his medication, like a good one, like, a, like he's supposed to. Of course, if we have a problem like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, a lot of times these individuals do not like their medication because it makes them feel dull, so they will go off their medication. But he's living with his mother. And I've got another case, a similar case. Uh, and this guy is, is with his mother now. Instead of in jail, which is saving the city of Albuquerque money, I mean, they're, all they're doing is paying for his, his medication, and now that's going to save them money because it costs so much money a day to keep him incarcerated. Uh, okay, so the first uh, intercept has to do with the first responders. Uh, uh, if, they, if they respond and, and the, they don't determine that the individual has a mental illness or has a drug problem, uh, they can arrest them, they can charge them uh, as a criminal. Of course, they can eventually uh, convict them and incarcerate them. Only about 0.3% of police encounters are with people suffering from mental illness, but it's increasing, of course. Uh, the problem was that once upon a time, about uh, 1980s, uh, we elected a president by the name of Reagan, and Ronald Reagan decided that he was going to save money by closing all the, the mental hospitals, and that's what he did. He closed all the state mental hospitals. So you had all these huge facilities. If you ever go to Norman, Oklahoma, uh, they have the, one of the largest mental hospitals in the United States, and it's closed. The, the only part that's open is the pharmacy, and it's in one building, and they've got, it's this whole campus full of buildings that are just completely empty. I don't know what they're doing with it. It's right off the, uh, the, uh, the University of Oklahoma campus. It's really kind of interesting. So over here is the mental hospital, over here is the campus. I don't know if they're going to move, you know, some of the uh, classes into the Mental hospital, that should be interesting, moving it into the mental hospital. <clears throat> anyway, so that's the way it's working in Oklahoma. 
Um, so Ronald Reagan closed the middle hospitals. So what happened to all the, in, the inmates, the people that were living in the middle hospitals? Well, they went home if they had a home. And if they didn't have a home, they went to the streets. They had no place else to go. These are fairly non-functional individuals. And they became homeless people. So like in, within weeks of closing the hospitals, we had this huge influx of uh, people suffering from mental illness. And of course, the people that were, that were uh, in favor of Ronald Reagan saving all this money, oh my goodness, we're saving all this money. <clears throat> they were really happy that they closed all the hospitals because they were saving so much money. <clears throat> and then of course, we had all these homeless people and they pretended that they didn't exist. So they were closing their eyes to this. And we've been doing the same thing ever since. We've been closing our eyes to all these homeless people, these people suffering from schizophrenia, people suffering from bipolar disorder, who can't function in society, yet we have no place to put them. So what do we do with them instead? Well, we arrest them, of course. When they, when they cause a problem, then we arrest them and throw them in jail. So it's the jails that are taking up the slack for what the mental hospitals used to do. In some encounters, arrest is unnecessary, of course. However, with training, these incidents can be controlled uh, instead of escalating into more dangerous situations. This can be a job for specialized police responding through crisis intervention teams. And, and some police departments do have crisis intervention teams. Uh, the crisis intervention team started in areas that it had a mental hospital. And so the vast majority of people uh, from the, the mental hospital were living as homeless people in that city. And because of that, they started this whole thing with crisis intervention te teams. So rather than uh, the, a, 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 a street policeman uh, encountering these individuals, they would call in the crisis intervention team, they would talk them down, uh, and potentially they wouldn't have to arrest them. So the crisis intervention teams were, were dealing with them. Uh, more and more cities are, are getting crisis intervention teams. Uh, you see crisis intervention teams, especially in, the, in the, the south, where it's nice and warm, and homeless people can live there with, uh, without freezing to death in the wintertime. Uh, New York has a large homeless population. Washington, D.C. has a large homeless population. Atlanta has a massive uh, uh, homeless population. Southern California has a gigantic problem with homeless people. San Diego, uh, Los Angeles especially, uh, have huge populations of homeless. Um, Phoenix, but not Tucson. Really? What's wrong with Tucson? What is wrong with Tucson? Has anybody ever lived in Tucson? Well, it's hot down there. I mean, you would think it would be a great place for homeless people, but why don't they have as many homeless people in Tucson as they do in Phoenix? Phoenix is farther north. It's very conservative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they... We really call these stats. They know they do. Yeah, and they... Yeah. The whole immigration thing there, too, is... Border it's patrol. Kind of odd. Yeah, they Border patrol is down there. And even with people from other countries besides Mexico, too, they're very... They're frowned upon. They're not Tucson's a much more conservative place than Phoenix is. Phoenix is far more liberal. Uh, they accuse the people in whatever the county is in Tucson of uh, shipping people up to Phoenix. They're homeless people of Phoenix. It's, it's pretty ugly. It can be pretty ugly. Intercept 2, uh, post-arrest, initial detention, initial hearing, and pretrial services. At an arrest, uh, after an arrest has been made, the individual will be brought before a judge to determine if the crime is serious enough to warrant a trial, and this is usually during the first appearance. Uh, normally during the first appearance, if he speaks, and a lot of homeless don't talk, <clears throat> if they're disorganized, uh, what we used to refer to as disorganized schizophrenic, uh, these individuals don't speak to people, or if they do speak, they don't speak intelligibly, so you can understand what they're saying. Uh, if a judge sees this, uh, then potentially they can intervene at that, at that juncture. Uh, but a lot of times these individuals will not open their mouths. Uh, so they can't tell if they're a, a disorganized schizophrenic. 
At this point, if mental health intervention is more appropriate, the judge may remand the arrestee for mental health evaluation. This only takes place if it is a liberal judge. If it's a conservative judge, a lot of times they'll just throw them in jail. They don't care. The intervention can also take place when drugs are being used uh, or domestic troubles are, are part of the problem. And of course, uh, intervention could take place at this point. Intercept three, post initial hearing, jail, prison, courts, uh, forensic evaluations, and commitments. If the individual has a special problem that can be solved outside the criminal courts, they may see a specialized court, a drug court, a mental health court, a homeless court, a domestic violence court, or community courts. They also have veterans courts uh, that see veterans. Uh, why would veterans need special treatment? Because of the PTSD. Because of the PTSD, exactly. Uh, normally, if, you, if you've ever been around somebody with PTSD, it's not prevalent all the time. Um, a lot of times, especially in a, uh, uh, a, a situation like court, a court of law, they won't seem bad at all. They'll seem fine. But then again, that's just like when they were in the military, exactly. Uh, so the only time that they have a problem is when uh, things are disorganized, uh, there's chaos taking place. That's when they have that, that's when they have their problems. It's not when things are are uh, strict. There's a uh, discipline. If there's any discipline involved, then they're fine, because that's the way that's the way it was when they were in the military. So they're okay then. So in a court of law, they look normal. They don't look like they have PTSD. So the judge can do anything he wants with them and say, well, they didn't seem bad to me. I didn't see any PTSD. What's the problem? <clears throat> However, if we send them to veterans court, of course, they're going to see the same thing. It's kind of interesting um, if you've ever seen a, if you've ever watched a video of, of people in a, a veterans court. You know, this guy was in the military for two years. You know, he was a draftee from Vietnam. Uh, he was a terrible soldier when he was in the military. They get him in a veterans court and they, at, they, they, they uh, ask him to stand at attention and he snaps to attention. This guy was the worst soldier in the world, and now all of a sudden, in, in that situation, he becomes a model soldier, as interesting as that is. Anyway, I know, it's funny. Even, even Air Force people will snap to attention. <laughs> they are such bad soldiers. Uh, the use of these courts improve people's lives. This is called, uh, this is known as therapeutic jurisprudence. I know. A medic in the Air Force, they've got to be the least disciplined people in the whole white world. My brother is um, the military police in the Air Force, I know what you mean. They were the only, the, the, the SPs were the only good soldiers in the whole Air Force. <laughs> they were the only ones that ever stood at attention. It was, not, it was, if you, not if you actually get to see some of their photos, diaries, and stuff like that. Oh yeah, I'm so, sure he was uh, just as bad as... Well, just as bad. <laughs> yeah, not as bad as the medics. We never cut our hair. The oh <laughs> we were bad. You know, the Marines have high and tights. We had, you know, loose and, yeah, flowing. Exactly. Like the Earth Army or the New Earth Army kind of thing, tight deal. I've got a picture of all my brothers. I, I ought to bring it next time. Yeah, all my brothers. We were all in the military at the same time. Uh, along with my dad. My dad was in the military, too. Uh, the only person with a GI haircut is my dad. <laughs> <laughs> And here I, you know, I'm in the Air Force, and here's my brother. I have a brother that was in intelligence. He got hair down, you know, below his collar. I, it's terrible. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, I, oh, actually, my brother, my other, bro my youngest brother had just gotten out of basic training, so he had a GI haircut. But him and my dad were the only two <laughs> that looked like they were military. The premise is that uh, legal systems should uh, help troubled individuals cope with chronic problems that brought them into contact with the criminal justice system, so we have these specialized problem-solving courts. The collaborative, non-adversarial uh, nature of specialty courts uh, in which judges work side-by-side -side with mental health professionals, community agencies, and offenders themselves focuses more on meeting the ongoing needs of the participants rather than on punishing them. So we're not really looking for punishment, we're, we, we're trying to help people. So that's what the, the whole purpose of the court is. Uh, to help people, rather than throw them in prison. 
This approach in which the law is used as a vehicle to improve people's lives is of course called uh, therapeutic jurisprudence and it uh, is, very, is relatively prevalent in urban areas, not so much in uh, rural areas. Drug courts uh, divert cases from traditional criminal justice system and link drug addicted offenders with treatment programs and extensive supervision. If you've ever watched uh, the television shows dealing with somebody who is a drug pusher or a drug user, a lot of times they will uh, ask uh, to go to these treatment uh, facilities rather than uh, to go into jail. And of course the policeman that arrested them it gets all upset because here this guy is a, a, a billion dollar uh, user or a, a pusher and they're sending him to uh, rehabilitation as if he's, a, he's that much of a user. The reality is he may not be using his product at all, he may just be selling it. But of course, his lawyer uh, gets him uh, uh, into one of these uh, special, special <coughs> courts and he's able to get, a, get away with it and go back onto the street and start selling it again, start pushing it again. In exchange, I'm sorry? Is it maybe even smarter about it too, because he knows what the users sure. and addicts want or not want. So how many times do you send somebody to rehabilitation? Very rarely. How many times do you send them to rehabilitation before you throw them in jail? Three, once. <laughs> it depends. Unlimited. Severe. <laughs> how much you, you, you have? Uh, do you just have paraphernalia? Do you just have a residual amount of, of drugs? Are you not carrying a 50-pound bale of marijuana? They're not, they're not transporting marijuana from Mexico anymore. Maybe when they're starting Only cocaine and heroin. Maybe when they're starting to become a danger to themselves, because they are already a danger to other people already. Right. Once they start damaging themselves because of what they're doing, that's probably when people are right. them. Well, if we're talking about alcohol, they can go back right. to treatment any That's number of times, because usually alcohol, yeah, well, it's legal for one thing. But if it's an illegal drug like, like crystal meth or whatever, or heroin or what, or or cocaine, uh, a lot of times uh, they will set limits as to how many times these people can go back. If they don't have proof that this individual has a uh, marketable amount of a product, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is if it's per, for personal use, a lot of times they'll just send them back to treatment over and over and over and over again. Because that goes with the law of the punishment has to fit the crime. Right. And a lot of the times in the law, it's usually the dollar amount sure. that they persecute. But the reality is, of course, as this person is trying to escape from the police, they're also getting rid so. of all of their product. I'm sorry, Denise, you were going to say something. Oh, I was just like, is it different in different states? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And Different counties states. counties, too. Right. right. Mm -hmm. The closer you are to the border, okay. the more harsh you are. The more harsh part, exactly. Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas are, are have some of the harshest laws. Is that same with Canada? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Canada, they, they do uh, s uh, smuggle, and it's so much easier to smuggle stuff across the Canadian border than the, than the Mexican border, but uh, there's not as much product up there. But a lot of times that's exactly what happens. They will transport their, their product from Mexico to Canada, and then they'll smuggle it down. Especially, well, even Chicago, I, I don't know if you heard about, uh, uh, what's the guy that, the guy that was just arrested. He had a, um, a smuggling operation that was coming up from Mexico, and they went directly to Chicago. So they were traveling on 80, 40, I'm sorry. They were traveling from 40. They were going up the interstate system, mm -hmm. and they were transporting their stuff on semis or in, uh, in uh, you know, tr trucks of one kind or another. And, and going up to Chicago. And the, the, this product was was meant for Chicago. It's not like it's going to Houston, and then in Houston they're deciding where to send this their product. No, this stuff was directly going to Chicago. And that's one of the reasons why Chicago's had such violent problems in the last two or three or four or five years. So they finally captured this guy, and then he escaped. If you remember, he escaped. 
And then they caught him again. They just caught him again, not very long ago. So they're going to throw the, they're going to throw the book at him, and, and he'll probably be in jail for the rest of his life. But what happened to his system, his, his transportation system? It still exists. It's just that he's not out to spend the money. He's in and spending the money. He's probably going to go to rehab. I'm sorry? He's probably going to go to rehab. He's probably going to go to rehab. <laughs> You're probably right. That's a good point. Oh, man. Drug courts diverse, divert cases from the traditional criminal justice system, and they link drug-addicted offenders with treatment programs and extensive supervision. In exchange for successful completion of the program, the court may, for example, dismiss the original charge. And this happens a lot. Uh, so they don't have a, it's not a felony. They don't have a felony on their record. Now they can vote. Uh, they can buy a house. And there's a lot of things that happen to you if you're an ex-convict. Uh, that uh, ruins the rest of your life. One of them is that you can't vote. That bothers people a lot. <clears throat> uh, how successful are drug courts in reducing uh, drug-related criminal activity? The findings are encouraging, though some drug courts work better than others. A meta-analysis of 60 studies found that the results were modest. Offenders assigned to drug court had a 45.5% recidivism rate. They're using the drugs for a reason. And a lot of times that a lot of times that reason doesn't go away. Treatment doesn't work. And so they go right right back and get arrested again. 45.5% of the times they get arrested again. That's just barely under half. Um, Non-drug court uh, group had 54.5% recidivism rate, which is over half. It's a difference of about 10%, not quite, 9% actually. Okay. So is it better to send somebody to drug court or not? And if you look at the uh, map, where, where are most of the drug courts? Well, for one thing, they're in urban areas, except in one case. And look at all the drug courts in Kentucky. Look at Kentucky. It's covered with them. And they have one of the worst recidivism rates in the United States despite all the drug courts. They also have one of the worst uh, cases of uh, prescription drug use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a story that actually will go with that. Um, a few years ago, here in the college, there was a student who was in college that came from Kentucky. Oh, my God. And they were half Navajo, and they were back here just Bear Cloth is from Kentucky. That's all I need to say. Have okay. you seen this cane? <laughs> you know, Louisville sluggers are not made in Louisville. Yeah. They're made in Jeffersonville, I mean, that's Indiana. What I told them. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. But yeah, before these two students came, there was really no problem with prescription drug abuse. But when those two students came, they were both males, they were brothers, and when they came to this school, there started to be a high rate of that. And then there were actually incidences, and that's not saying in the dorms. There was actually incidents in the dorm where girls were actually overdosing in their room on crushed up prescription medication that I guess they were snorting. So bad. So, yeah. And so when I asked them, you know, why is that, you know? Did you why ask them? This or why not that drug? You know, why this, yeah. why prescription drugs over anything else? I said, well, in Kentucky, that's what we do. In Kentucky, that's what we do. It's a very backwards thing. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I could, I should say that it's backward, because I'm from Indiana. <laughs> I'm in a far from a far more sophisticated place. But like that Indiana. was that was amazing though to see like how just the influence of one or two people with a certain kind of drug can just come into the Navajo Nation or to a small community and totally turn everybody everybody onto something. So else. why did these two guys from Kentucky come to Diné College? <laughs> They wanted they're to learn Navajo? Navajo? Yeah, they're oh, they're half, half Navajo. Navajo. Oh, that's and their, their mother, I guess, sent them back here so they could get to know their people. So instead of immersing themselves in the people, they just kind tried of to use immerse their the own people, people in, in their. And then, yeah. yeah. Uh, the place with the worst uh, prescription drug uh, problem is actually West Virginia, which is right next door to Kentucky. So we can see yeah. that Kentucky's trying to deal with their problem using drug courts, which are pretty bad, uh, but West Virginia is not doing any of that, as confusing 
as that is. And so they still have a, a really serious problem. What a mess. Uh, most of the drug courts, as you can see, are in urban areas. Uh, here's Phoenix right here. Or is that Tucson? I think that, that's Phoenix. Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Indianapolis, Columbus, Cleveland. Okay. Detroit, here's Detroit right here. Well, all the drug courts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So most of them are, are in urban areas. New Orleans. Okay. Baton Rouge, right up here. Okay. Was Chinley highlighted on that? Yeah, page? Chinley's right there. No, yeah, we missed Chinley. <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah, there it is, yeah, right there. Yeah, it is, right there. And then it says Page. Mm -hmm. Payson, Holbrook, Hayden, uh, Yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah, Holbrook. Kingman, Williams, Baghdad. <laughs> Yeah, there is Baghdad. You can read the Nevada border. You know exactly where Yeah, because the counties. <laughs> <laughs> I have that's, friends. That's so <laughs> sad. <laughs> Gallup, Albuquerque, yeah. Santa Fe. Shiprock? Is that Winter Rock? <laughs> I think that is Shiprock oh, right near the border. This one? No, the other side. No, this yeah. is Gallup. Oh, okay. So wait, does he leave? <laughs> Just kidding. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> Next slide. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the most successful drug courts were those that excluded violent offenders. That's a really serious problem. Uh, and this is one of the, the things that uh, lawyers will argue when they're trying to send their clients to uh, drug court rather than a uh, criminal court. Uh, they argue that they're not, they're not violent offenders. And because of that, they, sh they should be able to go to a drug court rather than a uh, regular court. Uh, these individuals worked with, uh, worked with and treated offenders who had not yet uh, entered a plea. Uh, these were the individuals that uh, had a, a reason to get through the program. If they hadn't entered a plea yet, of course, if they had entered a plea of guilty, then they would go to prison. But if they hadn't entered a plea yet, uh, of course, they had an opportunity to go to rehab and potentially get their case thrown out of court. Uh, it employed well-qualified and competent staff who ensured that the program was delivered as designed and interacted positively with participants. And of course, this is one of the things that uh, Dr. Wolf has been talking about. She wants to start a substance abuse program here so that we can graduate people with uh, certificates uh, to deal with uh, people uh, with substance problems. That's what she's trying to do. Um, possibly in the future. Uh, what we're looking at right now, we just hired a social worker, and we're not exactly what class, sure what classes they can teach, but if they can teach some of the classes that are needed, then potentially uh, I can teach uh, uh, other classes that will fit into the, uh, uh, the certificate program, and potentially we, in the future we will be able to offer a certificate uh, for substance abuse. Counseling, substance abuse counseling. Okay, there we go. Okay, so what's the problem with Kentucky? The problem with Kentucky is they don't, most of the people that are working in these uh, rehabilitation centers that are attached to these, uh, these uh, special courts uh, are not very well trained. They're very poorly trained. Uh, the requirements in, uh, actually we had a substance abuse counseling uh, certificate uh, back uh, 20 years ago. Uh, the requirements 20 years ago was, was much less stringent than it is today. So Arizona is really trying to help. Uh, they're, they're trying to make sure that these individuals have the capability of uh, dealing with uh, somebody with substance abuse. If you want to get hired in Kentucky, uh, you don't need a certificate. Uh, wow. You can, yeah. And a lot of times, well, the biggest problem that they have is that the people working there are pushers. They are people with uh, other problems. Well, who's I talking to? Well, I won't tell you who I was talking to, but <laughs> I could, because I just remembered who I was talking to, and they were the individual uh, had come in contact with individuals that uh, were in substance abuse, and they were saying that uh, a lot of the individuals working in substance abuse were drinkers. They were alcoholics. They were users. Yeah. 
I know an individual that works in public health, and the individual is a bad alcoholic. <coughs> How perfect is that? I know. I know. Okay. Has a master's in public health, but um, like during like family events, they're just like gone, like like totally full blown alcoholic. Like <coughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> I'm just like, I don't think I want a master's degree. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Wait a minute. How many, how many people with master's degree? Well, we got Robert <laughs> from Kentucky. <laughs> he lives that right down the street from me. Oh my God! Is right. he loud? Oh yes. <laughs> but he never. He doesn't have anybody to talk to at his house, so I don't hear him. Oh, okay. But, you know, if Margaret walks past, he yells at Margaret. Oh, my God. <laughs> he's got a big, he's got a loud voice. I, okay, this is an immigrant from Barbado, Barbados. He came into the court on charges of arson. The man was delusional, thinking that uh, he was the son of God. Wait a minute, if you're the son of God, that makes you Jesus? Well, exactly. Well, you know, when I read the first read the account, I was thinking, isn't everyone? I think he thought he was Jesus. Have you ever seen anybody with a Jesus complex? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh my, it's so interesting. <laughs> so nice. No, I know. Mine. They walk around no, blessing so people cool. and keeping their hands in front of them. It's really kind of, kind of interesting. I've been blessed by Jesus. <laughs> Not one Jesus, but like three different Jesuses. Uh, he, he had been hospitalized nine times in five years, so obviously he had a problem. In a traditional court, he would have pleaded guilty and then been incarcerated. In mental health court, he was remanded to the custody of his mother as long as he continued to take his medications. And of course, as long as he takes his medications, he will not have a psychotic episode. Hey, Bruce, maybe it's because you've been blessed by three different kinds of Jesus. That's why he never gets sick. Maybe. <laughs> That's why I never get sick. Okay, well. You survived the heart attack. <laughs> One of them was so tall and skinny. It was like being yeah, blessed by a basketball player or something. <laughs> Short people need to be blessed by people. <laughs> Later, when the man complained of a stomach problem, the judge signed off on a new medication and required the man to sign up for job training, allowed him to graduate from court. He only left with a misdemeanor on his record, so he could still vote. And he gave the man his cell phone number if he needed any more help. So obviously, it's not the same guy. That guy is lighter complexion than this guy. Okay. Their faces are kind of the same shape, but I couldn't find two people. Okay. Anyway, Barbados. Deinstitutionalization, uh, the long term trend of uh, closing mental hospitals and transferring care to community based mental health treatment facilities has left many mental, mentally ill individuals without services or medications. And I already told you the, the story as to how this happened. The reason I'm telling you the political aspect of it is because politics plays a huge role in what's going to happen uh, in mental health in the future. It has already played a huge role. Uh, conservatives, uh, the, the Republicans in 1980, right after Reagan was elected president, uh, this was one of the, the things that they ran on, and Reagan, of course, ran away with the election, and then he closed the mental hospitals and saved all that money, and people were more interested in saving money than they were in the, the health and welfare of all of these people suffering from mental illness. We keep seeing this, and we're going to be seeing it in the future. So what is, what's going to happen if Trump gets elected in 2020? Well, potentially, he may revamp, he may revamp everything. Well, he, he's trying to do away with Obamacare. If he gets, if the Republicans win uh, the Congress again, they may be able to get rid of Obamacare. And if they get rid of Obamacare, all of these new laws that have come in, in uh, place because of Obamacare will uh, be gone. They'll be completely gone. And we, we will be controlled by insurance companies again, just like we were before. So we've got to be cognizant of this. We've got to be cognizant of, of the politics. We can't, can't 
uh, exist outside of politics. We need to understand what's going on. And we need to be involved. Because these are, these are the people we're trying to help. And we can't help them if we don't have any money to help them. We can't help them if there aren't any facilities. We can't help them if they close all the hospitals. And that potentially is what might happen. The problem is money. Money's more important than people. I said this last year. Money's more important than people. Especially with this president. <clears throat> I'm not telling you how to vote. You can vote any way you want. But we need to be involved in this stuff. We need to be aware of what's going on. We need to care what's going on in the, the election in New Mexico, and especially the election in Arizona. I don't get any of the ads, so I don't know what kind of lies and propaganda you guys are getting on, on television. But I see conflicting advertisements with social notorious small. You know, one, one advertisement will say that she's going to destroy the United States, she wants to blow it up, and the next one will, says that she wants to, to help and make sure that health care is taken care of in the United States. So we need to be aware of all this stuff, and we need to be part of the, the dialogue. And we can't let the dialogue take over and, uh, so, the, so that we lose our, our uh, desire to help. That's what we're here for, right, is to help people. Okay, so we need to make sure that we understand who we're electing uh, in, uh, as far as our well, the, the politics are concerned. It's, it's not just the president, it's also the your congressmen, uh, your senators, you, you've got to know who these people are. and You need to know what they say about health care and what they say about mental health care. A lot of the insurance companies will not cover mental health. So if, uh, if Obamacare goes away, potentially that will go away as well. One of the problems we have with insurance uh, even the insurance that I have, no, actually the insurance that I have covers dental, dental, but dental care has been a real controversial issue over the last 30 or 40 years. And the reason I can talk about Reagan is because I was alive when this took place in 1980. I was here. I was in the military in the 1980s. And so I watched this stuff taking place. I didn't know what happens. These guys just kind of pass by. They don't, they don't even talk about it. They don't talk about the Reagan administration. But we need to understand who these people are and how they're going to vote and what they're going to do to our health care. You can be as conservative as you want, but a lot of times the Republicans care more about money than they do about people. So it's just something that you need to think about. <clears throat> so the, if you, if you uh, are... Uh, if, there, if an election is coming up, you need to find out who's running and what they believe as far as, as uh, your job is concerned. And you need to support the person that will support your clients. If they're going to take money away from them just to save some money so that we, they can you know, have a, right, a, a, a tax cut for the wealthy people in the United States, uh, wealthy people can already afford health care. <laughs> they don't have to worry about it. Wasn't there something said to, I don't know, during which administration, whether it was Clinton or Bush, but didn't they kind of make it legit for the world that people were more plants <coughs> and animals? And that's why they kind of just that's a, stop some of, or just continue some of the programs that are actually... Right. Kind of that's a very conservative people. point of view. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. So if you if you read the Bible strictly, it says that humans are supposed to be in charge of all animals and, and, the, and the earth and whatnot. So that's a very conservative point of view. So it's probably that was during the Bush, Bush administration. The Bush, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> the Clinton administration was fairly had a liberal. Different view about that, though, didn't he? This was opposite of that before the Bush administration. Well, uh, look what's happened with uh, look what. Uh, uh, Trump has done with uh, uh, national parks. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Open them up for business. Well, yeah, he's lo we're logging our national forests. Well, there's people we're right drilling now. oil and, and you know. Bears ears. I mean, they're having there's like pretty much a land rush, a gold rush, or whatever rush sure. is happening right now with bears sure. ears. Yeah. Because of that. Which is something that you need to think about. <clears throat> 
consensus rate? Is it just human nature to destroy? Is it for, is it, is for some people like well, not, Trump? Yeah, potentially. I mean, not not you guys. I mean, you guys want to take care of everything. Supposed to be stewards. Uh, stewards of the uh, of exact, the land. Of the land. Sure. Exactly. So that goes but that goes against what. But well, a lot of us have changed, though, because we're a very diverse group of individuals. So it kind of just, I don't know, I guess kind of get to the point to where we're contradicting our own beliefs and our own traditions and cultures. Well, hopefully that aspect will not go away. Thank you. Hopefully. National parks. Let's, let's keep the national parks. Now, what did he do? Um, the, the, he closed the national mine, or he... Uh, made select places no longer national monuments mm -hmm. anymore, uh, so they couldn't be protected by all these EPA laws. He has uh, emasculated EPA laws, so mm -hmm. They're less sensitive to the nature than exactly. they're, they're much more people in instead of nature and regenerating their I, I know politics are, are ugly, they're painful, they're, it gets you in arguments with, with funny they're people. Funny with everybody, but at the same time, we need to be aware that's part of our, of being a uh, psychologist, being a counselor, being a social worker. Uh, we need to be aware of what's happening around us so that we can protect our people. We can protect the, our clients. That's our job. You know, I would take a bullet for you guys. We heard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, I need to care what the administration is doing, and I need, to, I need to stay on top of those guys as well. I mean, just me being in front of you guys doesn't really help unless I'm willing to, 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 to do everything, to do everything. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I need to be aware of what's going on. So. So we all need to be uh, aware of, what, of politics. We don't have to participate, we just need to vote. And we need to make sure that we know who the good guys and the bad guys are. That all went away with, with Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Ronald Reagan destroyed political science as a, as a, as a science. Yeah. It was no longer a science. 